Good evening. We're on the air again with another edition of Patients on the News. Tonight, uh, we have somebody who is very knowledgeable about a topic that's in everybody's mind today, Ukraine, and the military situation in Ukraine, how it happened, where it might go. Uh, our guest tonight is a four-star, retired four-star Navy Admiral. He was the commander-in-chief at one time of um, allied forces uh, in southern Europe. He was the commander of the U.S. Navy in Europe. He was the commander for you Navy people who know all about the Sixth Fleet in the Mediterranean. He was the commander of the Sixth Fleet. His name is Gregory Johnson. He's from Westmanland, Maine, in Aroostook County, a graduate of Caribou High School, mm -hmm. a graduate of the University of Maine, and then he learned to fly Navy jets on aircraft carriers and enjoyed it. Enjoyed it immensely. Welcome, Admiral Johnson. Well, thank you, Harold. It's a pleasure to be with you again. And I think uh, most of the country is consumed by this situation that we've gotten ourselves into. And uh, hopefully we'll have a nice discussion about it as the evening goes on. So for, I'd just like to t talk briefly about your military career because it isn't often that uh, people from this state to go into the military and rise up either to four-star general or four-star admiral. Uh, you did. You were one of the top admirals in the United States Navy. You were the commander of uh, NATO South, mm -hmm. which is um, southern Europe. And, um, and you know something about this part of the world, Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you know something about the, the Russian military. You paid a lot of attention to that at one time, didn't you? Yes, I have, and uh, had many trips to Russia, both as a military officer, but also uh, working as an executive assistant to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Powell, for two years, and then uh, working as the military assistant to the Secretary of Defense, William Cohen. I, I, I neglected to point that out. That's important that uh, General Powell was this guy's boss and friend, and they know each other, knew each other uh, very well. And uh, when Bill Cohen, the former senator from Maine, was Secretary of Defense in the Pentagon, his aide was Admiral Johnson. So uh, he's He's been around this business for a long time. Incidentally, you've been to Russia several times, you say. Yeah. You ever met Putin? We did. Uh, in uh, 2000, when he had just become president, he was appointed prime minister for, well, he was head of FBS by, appointed FBS by Yeltsin, I think it was in 98. What's FBS? The spy agency? Spy agency. Which, the guy is, that's his profession, yeah. spy, right? And then he became the heir apparent. Yeltsin picked him. Uh, out of nowhere, and uh, he was then the uh, I've ele elevated to become the prime minister, and then when Yeltsin, Yeltsin suddenly designed and de resigned in December of uh, 1999, he became the acting president, and then they had elections in May of 2000, and he became elected as the president, served two terms, then served another term as prime minister, 08 to 12, and then he became, I think, president for life in uh, 2012. And uh, we met him, it was the summer of 2002, he had just become, it was after the election, he had just become the president, and we were there on a Nun Luger. The United States was spending money, uh, providing money to... Nun Luger, two senators, it was a... Yeah, D it was disarmament uh, denuclearization fund, and we were helping them actually get rid of their initial tranche of uh, nuclear-powered submarines the uh, ballistic missile submarines and some of their attack submarines because they didn't have the money to properly decommission them. So they didn't have the money to decommission them, but what about you American military people? You still had nuclear weapons oh, yeah. on submarines. Yeah, still well do. they did too. I mean yeah. they still had, uh, most of them were tied up at the pier, but they still had ballistic missile submarines and they certainly had missile silos all over the, uh, the former Soviet Union. In fact, one of the lessons that I think we need to be aware of is that in 1994, three years after the end of the uh, 
with the split up of the Soviet Union, there was a thing called the Budapest Memorandum, signed by Bill Clinton and uh, Yeltsin and uh, the first prime minister of Ukraine, because at that time, the third largest country with the most third most um, uh, amounts of uh, strategic ballistic missiles was Ukraine, left over from the days as part of the Soviet Union. And they worked out an agreement that pledged non-aggression and economic support forever and ever and eternity for Ukraine in exchange for Ukraine returning all those weapons to Russia. There were also some in uh, Belarus. They were tactical nuclear weapons, not strategic and they were returned, and there were also some in Kazakhstan. These were ballistic missiles that were returned to Russia. So those three former Soviet republics that at the end of the Soviet Union happened to have nuclear weapons, all of them were denuclearized, and those weapons were returned to Russia. But the lesson being, look what's happened to Ukraine. They gave up their nuclear weapons. What kind of a message do you think that is to Iran, to North Korea, and to the other pretenders who may think they should have them? Uh, I think we're going to have a real problem with nuclear proliferation here in the not too distant future. It's going to be upon us very, very quickly. And 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 the Ukraine having given them up mm -hmm. is an example for these folks. Correct, a good example. Yeah, a good example. For if you're Iran or North Korea, it's a very good example. And we just need to be mindful of that. Incidentally, I want to go back a step. Now here we are. We're talking about global relations, uh, we're talking about NATO, Sixth Fleet, all mm. the things that you've done. When you were growing up in a rooster, did you, did you grow up on a farm? Yeah. Did it, you imagine a career for yourself? I think I'll go make a career in the United States Navy and get to be an admiral. Is that something that was in the forefront of your mind? No, but I think there's a link. Let me, let me just yeah. finish up on the thing about yeah. Putin. We yeah. didn't, in that visit, we went up to Murmansk, but we, we came to Moscow first and met with the Minister of Defense. And then we had a call on this new president. Uh, and we, were, we went to the Kremlin, and of course he made us wait, 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 and wait. And then he finally came out to this outer room where we were sitting uh, uh, with uh, the Secretary Cohen and his small entourage. And uh, Putin came out. And all I remember, he was very short. He had no affectation. I mean, it was just a blank Lying face, face huh? yeah. and piercing blue eyes. And he just shook everybody's. I don't think he shook anybody's hand. He just, mm. yeah, yeah. and then they went in. I didn't go into the actual meeting, but I did meet him. And, uh, but it was just, you could not discern anything from that. He was just non, not, totally nondescript. He did, a, he did not emote whatsoever. Like a good professional spy. Yeah. I just, I just remember that about him. And uh, by coming back to growing up in Aroostook County, uh, you know, you don't know whatever gets into your mind, but back in those days, civil defense was a big thing. And where I grew up in Westmanland, about 15 miles outside of Caribou, we were about uh, 20 miles as the crow flies from Loring Air Force Base, just to the due west of it. And Back in those days, they had very active civil defense. We practiced it in school. I don't know what good crawling on your desk did, but we'd do all those things in my little one-room schoolhouse. And my parents went to these different meetings over at the base. They, they actively, and I remember them getting recognition manuals of all the Russian bombers and stuff, because they were coming over the polar ice cap, and they would bomb Loring, because <laughs> yeah, right. it was a sack base. And looking at those books, and, look, and I'd go out in this hill across from the house, stand there and look and say, I'm going to be the one to find, seize them if they come. But, you know, just as a six-year-old kid. Yeah, yeah. But I, those things went on in my mind. And then uh, many years later, with the year I was graduating from college, of course, 1968. At, at Arno. In Arno. And all deferments ended. I thought I was going to law school, but that didn't last. And through a long, circuitous route, a friend, a fraternity brother who had graduated a couple years ahead of me, uh, when I was told I was going to be drafted and I wasn't going to go to law school, uh, he happened to, he had just got his wings. He actually went into the Navy to a program called Aviation Officer Canada School and had gotten his wings and was headed for Vietnam. And they would send him back to recruit because they needed more pilots. And he happened to walk into my fraternity house when this was all going on. The Army and the Marine Corps wanted you. They needed second lieutenants in Vietnam. And I could get into the Army and the 
Marine Corps, but I didn't know if I wanted to be an infantry second lieutenant. And he just showed up, and I said, he was in a uniform, and I said, Bagley, what are you doing? He said, I are a naval aviator. A light bulb came on, I said, how do you become a naval aviator? And he said, just take this test, that's what I'm here for. So I took this test, and that's how I ended up in the and then Navy. It, and you signed up, and off you went yeah. to? I went to see Dean Godfrey. He said, well, that's happening. At the to, law school. Maybe. Yeah, that's happening to a lot of your classmates. Just go do your minimum time and come back to law school. But I ended up staying for 36 years. Because you liked it. Because I liked you it. You like flying airplanes? Yeah, but it was bigger than that. After I went to the War College, which I did as a lieutenant, a special program, and I was maybe a little dissatisfied with what I saw. Uh, because there's a lot. People were, people loved to fly, but it was, I, I, so there has to be a higher purpose for spending billions of dollars on aircraft carriers than so people can fill up their logbook with a lot of flight time and and uh, traps on a carrier and the year at the war college really changed my mind by there I began to realize that this was I was in a profession not to fill up my logbook but I was in the profession of peace and that was my job and that was the output and one of the most important outputs if you can create a peaceful world is the so freedom and democracy can flourish. Did you fly bombers or fighter, pilot, fighter planes? Well, they were tactical jets. Yeah. They were The first ones I flew were primarily attack airplanes, the A-7. I flew that most of my life, but then they were replaced by the F-A-18, which was a multi-mission. It could do fighter, it had a multi-mission radar, and it could do air-to-air -air and air-to-ground. And towards the end of my career, I, I flew mostly in them. And, and of course, I would assume in the uh, in the beginning of your career, before you reached captain and and uh, commander, maybe you you were mostly when you went to sea, you were on aircraft carriers all the time, all the time. All. And so was, you made a lot of aircraft carrier landings. Yeah, I spent a lot of time at sea and got a lot of hours and all of that. But again, I didn't. The flying was not an end in itself to me. It was a means towards mm -hmm. an end, and it was a very important part of our toolkit, national security toolkit, that includes much more than the Navy and much more than the Department of Defense, Department of State, includes the all, the, and, the, and the ultimate power of the United States of America is our economic power mm -hmm. and the power of our democracy. which To is, influence people. To influence people in positive, constructive ways. Right. So I thought that was a pretty important I think that's business to be involved in. And so I was very proud to continue to serve. We have people that say, you know, why do we worry about public diplomacy? Why do we worry about programs to make friends abroad? But as a person who's been involved in strategic matters for our mm -hmm. country, do you think that is important, that we do things with respect to other people and try to influence them, that we're the good guys? Uh, yeah, I think it's profoundly important and uh, you know we're still in the process of forming a more perfect union we're not the best we still have things to do we still have blemishes but I think it's the best that's ever been created this wonderful experiment that started what 246 years ago but it needs pruning you got to work in that vineyard every single day and sometimes I think we're forgetting that and the best thing that you can have I think to make sure that the light of freedom and democracy continues to shine brightly throughout the world is for the United States of America to be engaged. And when we draw back, uh, our European allies, again, the EU is a roughly comparable size of America, uh, but it's, it's in terms of economics and if you aggregated everything else that they have, but it's, you know, 20 something different countries. It's not a, as a cohesive thing as the United States. And so I think. They need our leadership, and but we continue to make mistakes. We denigrated NATO. Na NATO is profoundly important. We had the TPP well along, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and the first day of the Trump administration, he pulled us out of it. It was a huge mistake. So then every Pacific Rim country had to now, they couldn't count on the United States. Plus, by then, we had done several other things where we, that we backed out of. So the idea that you could count on America to support you as an ally uh, became very suspect, and it continues to be very suspect to this day. When you were the commander of NATO South, your staff were from various countries, isn't that correct? On the NATO staff. And the NATO in Naples, staff. Yeah. So you commanded an international 
mm -hmm. group of people. Mm -hmm. uh, and did you have deputies that were from other yeah, countries? Yeah, uh, when I first got there, my uh, deputy was a uh, three-star uh, Greek general. Mm -hmm. And the rotation had been, you have one for two years as Greek, and then you have one as a Turk for, for uh, two years. And then, yeah. so my second one uh, was, a, uh, was a Turkish Air Force three-star who unfortunately in 2016, along with almost all the senior officers I knew in the Turkish military, were put in jail by Erdogan. Really? Mm -hmm. And uh, Because he didn't want them to get too much Yeah, because they were, you know, Ataturks. They, they both, yeah. Mm, and uh, so he put many of them in jail. My J-5, the two-star army general who was head of my plans and policy, is now this Minister of Defense. In Turkey? He survived. Yeah. Survived the coup and stayed on Erdogan's side. He was the head of the military by then. You had close relationships with these folks. Yeah. I mean, I'd go to his house for dinner. Yeah. He was very political. I was the commander. He was a two-star, but yeah. he would always invite me to his house, and it was always a huge affair. And he became, uh, he went back and was head of their military college. And uh, the last time I saw him, he was there, and he hosted me for a lunch the, uh, when I was about to retire. And then he became the head of the army, he became head of the armed forces, and when the coup attempt happened, he was head of the armed forces. And the, uh, the people who ran the coup, they tried to get him to, to turn on Erdogan, he didn't. So Erdogan kept him as head of the military, although most of the service chiefs and senior officers were put in jail. Yeah. And then he became the Minister of Defense, and to this day he's the Minister of Defense in uh, Turkey. So let's... Uh, turn a little bit to uh, the Ukraine mm -hmm. and how we got here. Yeah. And maybe you could comment on your view of how we arrived at where we are today with this war going on in mm -hmm. the Ukraine. Well, I have pretty strong feelings about it. And, uh, and of course, I'm viewing it from the advantage, the retrospective view. And, of course, you always have 20-20 vision when you're looking at things retrospectively. So it might be a little bit unfair. But when you aggregate all that and look at it, I call it 20 years of fecklessness. And that may be a bit harsh, but I think it's absolutely true. Uh, you know, through the- Going back to- Bush administration, to, yeah. Obama administration, Trump administration, yeah. and into this administration. But it wasn't just us. It was NATO, it was Europe, it was the EU, and all like-minded nations throughout the world. We, you know, we, kind of believed that this was the end of history and this was a new, we couldn't imagine that we would be dealing with someone like a Putin, the Putin that we see now. Uh, and, uh, you know, we were hoping, and hope's never a good plan, but I guess somehow we thought, you know, he really was, you know, had wool all over him and was a sheep and he wasn't really a wolf. And, uh, but I think if you studied Russian history and, and listened to him, he told us exactly what he was going to do and, 2007 at the Munich uh, Defense Conference, Security Conference, uh, and uh, he went on and on, and he started with Kosovo, the war, and then the treachery of NATO continuing to move, bringing in the former Warsaw Pact countries, first uh, Poland, Hungary, and uh, the Czech Republic, and then we brought in seven more uh, a few years later. 2004, I think it was, or 2007, we brought in uh, the Baltics, the three Baltics, uh, Slovakia, Slovenia. Uh, uh, All the ba countries that surround Russia. Bulgaria and Romania. Yeah. And uh, then, this is now February of 2007, in April of 2008 was the annual uh, NATO summit. I believe it was in Budapest. And again, the... Bush administration was deeply involved in Afghanistan and Iraq, but President Bush, and you know, rightly so in some ways, was pushing this democracy theme. And so they went into the summit. He was getting towards the end of his term, and they went into that summit pushing for, uh, you know, offering the opportunity for Ukraine and Georgia to come into NATO. They didn't give an actual path for them to come in, but they, they hung the carrot out there. And by the summer of 2008, Mr. Putin was sending troops into two of the provinces that had a, a, a considerable Russian population in Georgia. 
and we didn't do anything. We just let them do it. And uh, we didn't respond in any way. And uh, to, you know, then in, we had the red line in Syria. They, by the way, they had to leave the Middle East when they ran out of money in the late, uh, they shut down their bases in Syria and what have you. You're talking about the Russians. The Russians did. And uh, so then uh, we said uh, the red line was the use of chemical weapons, and they used them. And we were all ready to strike, but the night before we struck, we were going to strike, we backed away from it. And you mean the carriers were loaded? Everybody was loaded. It was, uh, you know, a, a, a significant effort to knock out all of their, anything related to their chemical weapons. And we... And could, uh, and could we have done that? Uh, Do we have the capability? Well, we would have heard it to be able to get every bit of it, and you never have 100% efficacy in, in any strike. You, you know, it's never, it's never going to go perfect. But it was a pretty robust, I don't know exactly what it was. I wasn't on active duty then, but I know we'd done the planning. If they were down to within 24 hours of execution, there was a lot of granularity in that thing. And the forces were in place to be able to execute this. And then we came up with the idea, the Russians said, oh, well, we can help you. We'll help you get rid of all this chemical weapons. And we bought off on it. We did it. That yeah, got the that. Russians said that we can get rid of the chemical weapons in Syria. Yeah. 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 And so they helped us. Of course, they didn't get rid of all of them. But that got them back in. And then they, they you know, when Putin first came in in 99 and 2000, they were dealing with Chechnya, And they leveled that place. But much smaller than Ukraine and only, I don't know, a little over a million people. And then they came to Syria and they leveled Aleppo. They surrounded it, just basic medieval siege warfare, cut off the water, cut off the electricity, cut off the food, and then bomb them into submission. And tried out a lot of their new weapons and what have you. And, uh, and they were back into the Middle East, and they're still there. And uh, so then, you know, then they had the, the overthrow of the friendly uh, president in in 2014. Medvedev, yeah. yeah. No, no, it was uh, started with a Y. I can't remember his name. Oh, in the Ukraine. In Ukraine. Oh, Yevtushenko. Yeah, and uh, and that was right when the Olympics were. Yeah. And uh, they overthrew him, and he had to seek safety in in um, Russia, and they got a new president that was much more friendly to the West and was yeah. back on wanting to become a member of EU and NATO and what have you. And so that's when he decided to go into Crimea. And right as soon as the Olympics were over, he went into Crimea, and then he started his campaign in the Donbass, and they've been fighting there ever since. But again, uh, we didn't really do anything after he took Crimea. And we've helped them a little bit, but begrudgingly for the last eight years on providing weapons for them to fight the uh, uh, Russians in the Donbass region. And we've been m mute on on Crimea. And, and of course, in Putin's mind, you know, that was rich. There's no question about Crimea, because that was when the Soviet Union decided to come up with these Soviet socialist republics, which Putin thinks is a horrible idea, because that gave them some geographic identity and they were long ethnic lines. Independent and, of Russia. Yeah. Well, not independent. They were but part of the Union of Soviet Socialist yeah, Republics, yeah. and by far the dominant republic was Russia. Right. And, you, and Crimea was part of Russia. But then this guy came along in the late 50s named Khrushchev, who was a Ukrainian. And he decided, since I'm in charge here now, it would be really nice if we made Ukra uh, Crimea part of Ukraine. And so by fiat, I, I don't know exactly what the process was, he decided to take Crimea and make it part of the Soviet Socialist Republic of Ukraine as opposed to the Soviet Socialist Republic of Russia. And that's how, and so in Putin's mind, he's just righting a horrible wrong done by the communists. And of course, he does not consider himself to be a communist. He's not a communist. He's, no, he a, he's a Russian and of Catherine the Great and Peter the Great. And that's the world that he's trying to uh, bring back. And he brought back the Orthodox Church and what have you against the decadence and increasing weakness of the West. And so in that speech he gave where he talked about the West, all they want is their foie gras and oysters. Is this in the Munich conference where he made that? No, no. this was in just in his more, more recent comments. Okay. 
and uh, and then he talks, and they're all they spend all their time worrying about uh, all the options for sexual orientation or something, which he considers an example of the weakness and decadence of the West. And so all of this stuff is is this. I mean, he really does have a a vision. We may think it's warped and crazy, but he really does, I believe, have this messianic vision. And he fully intends, because every signal he has is that we are weak, democracies and freedom are in decline, and I think that's unarguably. Freedom House, every indication you have, that's the case, and autocracy is on the rise. So it's not just Ukraine versus Russia. We are in, I think, a much larger uh, kind of battle going on, and those, China, India, Turkey. Nationalism is on the rise. Nationalism. Nationalism is on the rise. So um, we have, we, in the 1930s, we have good examples of mm -hmm. nationalism. Germany, Japan, mm -hmm. Italy, all nationalistic mm -hmm. countries. And nationalism has great appeal. You know, uh, this is a little bit off point, mm -hmm. but it, it has appeal in, in this country, too. Yes. When we, it, it appeals to human beings, they, their tribe is being aggressive and doing mm -hmm. things. And that's my tribe, and they take great pride in their tribe and mm -hmm. some kind of self-identification for people. Mm -hmm. And I remember wh when in 2003, when we uh, invaded Iraq mm -hmm. in the fall of 2003, that winter I was uh, down I uh, visiting some people in... Uh, Vero Beach, Florida, and I'd never been to Vero Beach before. And if we think back, and a lot of people will remember this, cars were flying after the invasion, cars were flying the American flag. Everybody had a flag. And when I went to Vero Beach, people were hanging American flags out their windows. Mm -hmm. uh, so this jingoism, I call it, or others call it, uh, and nationalism has great appeal in this country, too. Mm -hmm. And when, he, when a, a demagogue can say, hey, look, we're going to be the most powerful. We don't care about everybody else. Yeah, they're all on their own. America for America, and the hell with those other people. That's a form of nationalism. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have died in the name of nationalism. Yeah. Well, I've made my, thank you for allowing me to make my little speech. No, I, I totally agree with you. I think it's, it's very dangerous, and any politician that's pretty keen on making sure they can get reelected can, if they want to, use that weapon, and they're very good at it. And uh, that's what a part of what I'm trying to say about this. If the flame of uh, democracy and freedom begins to flicker anywhere in the world, it's not just that local area, but it's all of us who believe in this. And again, that comes back to why I found serving in the military is such a compelling profession because that's what I thought I was doing, trying to protect that flame and keep that flame burning in as many places around the world as possible and that we were an imp maybe a slightly imperfect but as good an example of where the human spirit and the capacity of each individual, has they have the best opportunity to fully actualize what they can uh, what they can bring to their particular country, to their particular state, to their particular town, to their family, and, uh, and that is the best way for our country and for our state and our communities to succeed. It's the best way for the world to succeed. It's the best way where we can, you know, work at all the many problems we have throughout the world. So that's kind of my fundamental belief. I am pleased that you said that, and I'm happy that my audience got to hear a senior American uh, military man uh, say the things that you said, because politicians don't often say it. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe military people don't often say it. You did. Well, I think, uh, I would like to think that the people I served would believe that. And General Powell, you think he believed oh, it? Oh, yeah. I mean, he, he profoundly believed that America... I mean, his life was an example of that. I had an opportunity, and I took full advantage of it, and it richly blessed me. Mm -hmm. Rich, I mean, yesterday I was at 
up at the University of Maine and uh, for the Cohen lecture and Secretary Cohen was there and the guest speaker was uh, General Mattis. I call him General Mattis, but Secretary Mattis and, and uh, the, the youngest. Did you know Mattis when you Yeah, were? we worked together for Secretary Cohen. He was yeah. Colonel Mattis then. He was the Executive Secretary. Marine Colonel, huh? Marine Colonel then. So we go, we go back to the time we were together as the part of the Cohen OSD, Office of Secretary of Defense Family. It was a great group, some wonderful people. That's great. Yeah. So now that, let me uh, direct the discussion a little to uh, the Ukraine because you are a military man and uh, all of us thought with well, this big monstrous military machine, uh, Russia, they're going to invade uh, the Ukraine and it's they're going to be in Kiev in three days and it's going to be over. Mm -hmm. And I really believe that. What happened to this massive military machine? Well, uh, you know, we're all still wondering. We're still going to have to, you know, see what the uh, postscript is about all of it. But I believe that we're into it. We've worked ourselves into a stalemate, that's, and, it, and we don't have any good options now. We didn't have very many good options when it started because of what I call the 20 years of fecklessness. We worked ourselves kind of into a box canyon, decreased our deterrent capacity, and and we never called Putin's bluff over the last 20 years, or didn't do it enough and emphatically enough, and so he thought he had free hand. But now we're where we are, and the Russians, I think, greatly underestimated uh, the Ukrainians. Uh, I think they were guilty of something that empires throughout history have been guilty of, you know, for lack of a better expression, drinking your own bathwater. I mean, he really believed it. And he believed that, you know, anybody that had anything to do with the West was weak and decadent and in decline, and that they would truly welcome him. And of course, the, using the term Nazis is very important to him because that was the great patriotic war. And they believed that that society of the 30s in Berlin was decadent and it was, so, you know, this is a big part of, of their, every country has their story and their legend, and that's a huge part they, of the Russian. Ironically, the Ukrainians were in the midst of the great patri yeah. patriotic war, and ground they think, up, and they, yeah, and they think Putin's a Nazi. Yeah, he behaves yeah. like Hitler. Yeah. So they got ground up then, and they're getting ground up now. Yeah, and uh, so the every side has a plan when you go into a war, like World War One. You know the. French were going to attack on the east, and it was going to be quick and over, and the Germans had the Schefflin plan. They were going to come through Belgium and be in Paris in one day, and it was going to be all over. And they ended up in trench warfare for four years, slaughtering each other. And it was never a definitive one way or the other. And I think that's kind of where we are now. The Russian plan was, you know, they just had to drive into Kiev, and they were going to surrender and put in a puppet government, and it was going to be all over. And uh, it didn't work out that way. They made huge mistakes. Then the biggest one is underestimating their enemy. And uh, it's much different when you have a conscript army that hasn't been told what they were going to do, hasn't been trained for what they were going to do. And uh, they aren't f they're fighting their fellow Slavs. But the Ukrainians were fighting for their own country. And the level of passion and then the just so many tactical mistakes they made. <laughs> That, that makes a difference, doesn't it, when you're fighting for yeah. your own country. Just, we found that out in Vietnam. Yeah, we did. Same thing. Yeah, we've learned, we've, we've had to learn that in lots of places. We've we learned have. it, uh, not quite, maybe, we learned it in Korea. Yeah. And, uh, or we identified that, whether we learned it or not, I don't know. I hope we did. I hope it, it sticks with the us. The lesson was there. The lesson was there to be learned. And so, you know, they made a big mistake. The Ukrainians were hoping that uh, with uh, their, their strong will, which they knew was underestimated. They had come together as a coherent, uh, I think, uh, ident national identity. Uh, and uh, they fought surprisingly well, very it, effectively. It isn't it interesting? What Putin has done has really enhanced mm -hmm. the national identity of mm -hmm. the Ukrainians. Yeah. Those who might have been on the fence a little, well, I'm kind of like a Russian. Yeah. Now they see these dead people in the streets and they hate Russians. Yeah. Here they are, they're basically, you know, same Slavic 
uh, uh, well, it brought ancestors. Brought NATO back together, brought the EU, starting to spend money on defense, realizing this is really serious stuff. So it's done all the things that he wanted to prevent, and he thought he could drive a wedge in. He thought he had the Germans in his pocket, I think. Because uh, of the gas? Yeah. And, I mean, look, their former prime minister, I mean, his, his chancellor is on the board of the two biggest yeah. fossil fuel companies. And I mean, I, I can't quite understand that, but he still is. Schroeder, and uh, so uh, that didn't work. And uh, then the Ukrainians thought, well, they're going to fight well, they're going to stop them, and then the sanctions will kick in. Well, the sanctions aren't kicking in. The ruble is almost back to where it was when this thing started. It will, I think, over time, but it's going to take six months or a year. So how? So the Ukrainian plan, shall we say, with the support of the West, that plan didn't work either. It failed. The Russian plan failed. So now we're. I think they're retreating and they're going to just continue with their siege mentality in the Donbass area and they're going to try to take all of the south of so that the Ukrainians don't have any ports like Odessa and make them you know Odessa is the last big place to fall and then they'll have a land bridge all the way from the Donbass down to Ukraine and then really all the way to the Moldova and uh, Romanian border and so what does that do for your former compatriots in NATO, particularly the newer NATO countries mm -hmm. uh, on the eastern mm -hmm. frontiers of, uh, toward, uh, in, in the direction of Russia. You think this is going to focus them like lasers on building their military cap capacity? Well, it, I think it already has, uh, and, but the, of particular concern of the Baltics, and the, no matter how much they spend on defense, they don't have, they'll never have enough to alone, nationally, defend themselves. I mean, it's the strategic depth they have is like Israel. They don't have any strategic depth. And uh, Russia can stomp through there fairly quickly. But unless, if that happens... But we need to put a deterrent force Okay, in when I get to the, the, yeah, the deterrent okay. force, I mean, well, so if they're, they're in NATO, so an attack on a Baltic Republic is an attack on the United States. Mm -hmm. And then we will fight. There will be boots on the ground, right? Well, it's going to take political leadership of the United States of America, both in the executive and, and uh, legislative branches, going to the American people and explaining to them that they have to make this sacrifice and we have to do that. I would like to think that we will honor our Article 5 uh, obligation, and I have no doubt that we will. But it is not a eventuality that I think American public has been uh, properly uh, conditioned for and a reality that could very well happen but I think one of the good things that's coming come out of the failed plan on the Russian side and the failure on the Ukrainian Ukrainian West side to, to hurt him bad enough where he can come to the table with uh, a serious intent of some kind of a off-ramp is that his military has been proven to be a bit of a Potemkin military and right now, he doesn't have the capacity, uh, at least conventionally, and I don't think he will, would use a nuclear means of going to the Baltics. I think at this point, he, he just doesn't have any forces left. The only things he can use to plug are more conscripts who even He has if, a big navy, though, doesn't he? He has, and they're, they're pounding away at Odessa, but they did sink one of their ships. And, uh, you know, I don't know how effective they are. They said one of the Russian ships, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, do they have him, can they land troops like the U.S.? They did. They've been landing some Marines and stuff and, and all, all along the Sea of Azov and down yeah. into the part of Ukraine that's on the, uh, you know, south of or to the, slightly to the uh, east of, uh, west of uh, Crimea goes around where Odessa is to, that butts into Romania and then because Moldova is totally landlocked so it doesn't have any coast at all but Romania has a coast that comes up into that north uh, west corner of the Black Sea and they have a co-border there with uh, uh, Ukraine as they do way up north on the other side of Moldova up near Poland. So could the United States to put more pressure on could the United States, of course, this would be an act of war, too, I guess, a, a, a U.S. act of war, um, block access to the Black Sea uh, for Russian naval vessels to traverse 
the Bosporus and gain access to the Mediterranean? Well, the Montreux Convention, the, the, the power to do that rests with the, the Turkish government. And I believe, I may be wrong, but I think they have said that they aren't going to allow any more Russian combatant ships from the Baltic fleet or the northern fleet, but the Russians did bring around from the from the uh, Baltic fleet and from the uh, North Sea fleet uh, quite a few naval ships. That are up into the Black they're, Sea? They're already in there before hostilities began. I don't know exactly how many. I don't know what their order of battle do they, is. Do the Russians have naval bases? Yeah, they do. The, the main, the, the Black Sea fleet yeah. was based in Sevastopol, and when I, when I was a Sixth Fleet commander, I did a took my flagship up there and it was been the summer of 2001 and I visited Sevastopol and uh, visited the Ukraine. You were the commander of the Sixth Fleet? Yeah, then? and yeah. visited the commander of the Ukrainian Navy. He hosted me in Sevastopol. And then, but two-thirds of that naval base was owned by the Russians and they had many more ships than the Ukrainians did. And then my next stop was with the Russian Black Sea Fleet commander, but he got his flagship underway steamed it right past ours, we were at anchor, <laughs> and went over to Novorossiysk where they didn't even have any piers or anything. Yeah. He anchored his flagship and hosted me ashore in a hotel. Well, why, why, why? Because he wasn't going to host me in Sevastopol. Oh, really? Because that, you know, that was, the, why? the Ukrainians owned it at oh, that time. Oh, because he was Ukrainian. So he went, he went over to Novorossiysk and that's where he And that's where you me. went to visit him. Yeah, and we spent most of the time looking at all these incredible dioramas they have everywhere of the great patriotic war yeah and uh, and then but he hosted me at a but you know that Black Sea Fleet commander and I don't know whatever happened to him the night we, we had a formal dinner at, in, a, in a like a in a restaurant that you know, it was part of a hotel and it, it, it wasn't very fancy I will say but it was the best they could do at that time but he gave a toast at that dinner that still I cannot believe. He uh, thanked me because he got the toast first because he was the host and then I returned the toast. And, uh, and, to, and uh, he was incredibly gracious and thanked me for coming to visit. These were hard times uh, for Russia. This is now over a year into the, the Putin reign and it was, I believe, it was after the submarine sunk, uh, blew up in the, up in the uh, Barents Sea in the Northern Fleet. And uh, he said, he said, I, I, I want to tell you, I admire your country. He said, I admire you. The and, Russian, and he was an admiral, right? Yeah, and what your country does and what it stands for. And, uh, and he said, uh, and uh, he said, and you come here in the name of peace and friendship. And it was a beautiful, actually, toast. We had it, yeah. we, it was given in Russian, and he, uh, you know, had an interpreter, but I think it was, I, I believe it was kind of. Well, because he's not a politician. Yeah, he's a military man, yeah. he's not a politician. So, anyway, it was kind of interesting, but, uh, you, you know. You mentioned the, something about the Russians, so Kosovo. What did. What did the Russians do? I thought that was the Serbs and then the U.S. trying to get the Serbs to ease well, up on Kosovo. The, well, and I, you were in charge. I mean, this was part of your mm -hmm. bailiwick, right? Well, the Kosovo War started uh, in 99. Yeah. And uh, uh, Cohen was the Secretary of Defense. And uh, I became his military assistant in May of 1999. And uh, the... Uh, Cohen had been uh, at his son's graduation, his youngest son's graduation at the University of Maine. I think it was on the 9th or 10th of May, 1999, and he gets this message from the security team or the communicators that were with him, and he was in, I guess, the Collins Center at the graduation, saying, you gotta, you gotta call the Pentagon right now. And that's when uh, we had dropped an errant, not an errant bomb, but a, a target that we thought was a warehouse was actually a Chinese embassy. Where was it? In, in Belgrade. Belgrade? Yeah. And uh, they had to go back to Washington. And, and then uh, the war ended, and, uh, and that was a real rough patch with the Chinese, as you can well imagine. And because uh, we went to China in 2001, and 
I remember and that. Heard of, and you heard about it. We heard about it, yes. But um, so the war ended, and the, by then the, we had uh, S4 in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And we, in part of Partnership for Peace and the effort that we had to try to work with the Russians, they had a sector in Bosnia, and they had a, I don't think they had a full brigade, but they had a couple battalions there. Who had the? The Russians did. Russian. It was part of S4, the Stabilization okay. Force in Bosnia Herzegovina. What's the difference between that and I4? I4 was the predecessor to S4. Okay. And then uh, uh, during the night, uh, when the, we were ready to have a truce in Kosovo, and set up the NATO peacekeeping force called K4. It was going to be in Kosovo. They road marched. It wasn't much more than a company plus. It wasn't a full battalion. They went across the river up in Tuzla into Serbia, down through Serbia, and then through the northern part of Kosovo, the, the Serbian part or the of, uh, Slavic part of. Were you at NATO then? I was with Cohen then. I was a military yeah. assistant and showed up at the airport and closed the runways. And uh, so then Cohen was, we had to, we flew to, f then the, in this, so we were at this impasse of how to set up the, the uh, NATO forces and all the NATO fo countries were offering up forces. And of course, Greece, they wanted to be in the Serbian parts and protect the monasteries. And yeah. everybody had their different in the, the French wanted to be near the Croats and the Croatian. <laughs> you know, it was quite a process to figure out how we're going to do this whole thing. And then you had the Russians sitting there at the airport, which you needed. It was key to the logistics of the whole thing. So Secretary Cohen was charged with going to negotiate with the Russian defense minister in Helsinki in the presidential palace there. And we went there for three days and back and forth, back and forth. And so you were in those talks? Yeah, I was in those talks. And they would come in and we'd have these, and we had our red lines, they had their red lines. And, you know, it was always, yep, and they'd storm out, go get in their Zill limousines. <laughs> and we'd watch them as they go out. Of the, the, the road went past the presidential palace. They'd leave there in a huff. And, and the road, like, it was a block or two away. And if you turned one way, you were headed for the airport. If you turned the other way, you were headed back to the Russian embassy. They always turned towards the Russian embassy. So we knew, okay, we just got to They weren't leaving here. town. They weren't leaving town. So we said in the, at 2 o'clock in the morning or something, they decide they want to talk again. So you go back and start negotiating again. This went on for three days. Theater. Yeah, theater. And they fi we finally came up with something. And then Secretary Albright flew in. And uh, Ivanov, I believe, was the foreign minister then. He came over. And so you had the two def Minister of Defense and the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of State and the Minister of Foreign Affairs and worked out this agreement with how we would include the Russians in K-4. And then later, I ended up in Sixth Fleet, and then I ended up being at uh, Allied Forces Southern Europe, where K-4 commander was a subordinate commander, and so I spent a lot of time. I would go visit the Russian folks. They were in charge of, uh, like, uh, snow removal and keeping the runway open, but we <laughs> control the tower. And, isn't that it? So you say they can stay, but here's what you were going to yeah, be doing. Yeah, we worked it you, out. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, it was, it was an interesting time. When and we bombed Serbia, did we, those planes come off of aircraft carriers? Some did, but most of them were Air Force Ones. We had, you know, Air Force and Aviano and different places in, in Italy? Italy. Yeah. And they were NATO. The French were involved, the Ta Italians, uh, other countries were involved. So, but, and, we, and the big chaos. Uh, Combined Air Operations Center was in uh, in uh, Vicenza, Italy. So, is the, are these NATO forces effective? They're all different countries and everything. How do they work together? Do they have a common command? For, I mean, wh how do they function as a single unit when they represent twenty different countries? Well, it's it's an elaborate process, and you and but we. You know, they went with us like, at great political expense to many of these countries. They, we didn't have much trouble getting them to be part of our effort in Afghanistan. But it was, a, it was a hard slog to get them to be part of the effort in Iraq. And, of course, some of them never did. And they yeah. posed us strongly like the French. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but they mostly did. And even back in those days, I remember helping the Hungarians helping, they all, all, particularly the Warsaw Pact countries, wanted to be able to put something into the effort 
Uh, what do you mean by helping the hungry? Well, well, they would have a transportation unit. The Poles were uh, made a big contribution in Iraq. They were down. Uh, I visited a Polish unit. And by then, uh, I was a commander in uh, Naples, and we were starting up the NATO training mission. And NATO, under its auspices, got involved in Iraq you know, on the training and education side and what have you. And they were involved in combat operations in, in Afghanistan, a lot of the uh, NATO countries. You know, that was one I can't figure out. What was NATO's interest? I know. They, what were NATO's interest in Iraq? Yeah, but they were, they were NATO countries. They were NATO's countries, but I mean. They weren't, they weren't there as NATO. Oh, they weren't there as NATO. No, okay. No, no, no. no, no, no. Yeah. But they were. The, so the command and control process and the exercises that we have done all the, over the years that facilitated being able to work with them, they still go back to their national command authority. You know, ideally, when the big one comes, if it ever does, they're going to be working for a NATO commander who is the head of U.S. forces in Europe, but he is also the Supreme Allied Commander Europe, and that's always an American. And uh, so how effectively in a real serious war that is going to be dynamic and changing and every war plan, no matter how good it is, as soon as the first shot is fired, it becomes how good is a force in being able to adapt and innovate uh, as a, in the changing battlefield because it'll, it'll never go down the way that you have planned. That's and that's important. why... Never go as planned. No. And so that's why, that's another reason why the Russians, there's no trust. They don't trust their people. And so when that war started going wrong in, in, uh, in uh, Ukraine, Ukraine that, I think that's part of the reason. I think they've confirmed at least six or seven general officers, and these aren't one, these are like two stars, yeah. been killed. The, a captain that's the head of a, a, a company of armor or a company of artillery or a company of infantry doesn't dare to do anything. He doesn't have, they haven't given him authority yeah. to do anything. He's, he has one little plan. He's told to go down this road and go to point A or point B. So he does that. And in the U.S. military, we diffuse that authority more? We spread it yeah, out? We, you have commander's intent. Like the commander's intent for Desert Shield and Desert Storm under George H.W. Bush was, this was the General Schwarzkopf. It was something like two sentences. It was expel Iraqi forces from Kuwait and set the conditions for the return of the sovereign government of Kuwait. That was the that was the... So if you're a company commander and everybody above you, the colonel's killed and all of that, and you're a company commander... Yeah. There's usually a commander's intent and there's some kind of a statement about end state. Yeah. And that gets sent out to the field commanders. That's at the strategic level, but that gets down to the operational level commanders, and then it gets down to the tactical units. They know what that commander's intent is, and then they have lines of, of uh, operations... They plan, you know, what their armor's going to do, their, all of this stuff, and coordinate with the Air Force and the Navy. And, but, but it's never going to go like what the plan is. And so you're going to have to segue or, or you're going to, you know, you're, you're going to have to improvise off the main plan. And we command by negation. What's that mean? We've given you what the plan is, you know, set the conditions for the return of the sovereign government. And you go off and do the, the God's work and do this. Well, if you're really screwing up, they are going to reach down. They're going to negate from above. But until you show them... You're in charge. You're in charge. And they will... And, and I think, you know, you really have to screw up. But the first CO I ever had uh, as a lieutenant junior grade in A7 squadron in Cecil Field, Florida, uh, and in the summer when you're on the weekend, you'd always get the weekend duty... And uh, your biggest thing was thunderstorms and stuff and real wind. And you had to put extra tie-down chains on the airplane so they didn't get blown around. And he said, okay, you're going to be the duty officer. You're going to be out here all by yourself. And you're just going to have a fire watch and a couple other people here with you. And if something happens, I want you to address that issue and do something. Even if you do the wrong thing, I'll back you. But if you don't do anything... 
I'm going to fire you. And uh, I think that level of trust. In and you the, said they don't have that in the Russian military. I don't think so. They just don't trust their people. And I don't know, I can get off on a tangent, but it's an incredibly telling story. Uh, I don't know how we're doing on time. But we, we got about two more minutes. Oh, God. Three more. Tell it. Well, this is, this is the, at the end of the Cold War when Admiral Crow was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and he had his Russian counterpart there. He visited Washington, D.C. And uh, they visited, you know, all the stuff in Washington, D.C., and all the memorials. And they took him to a VA hospital, too, and they couldn't believe what we did for our veterans. But then they took him down to Norfolk, and he took him out on a carrier. And if you've ever been to Norfolk, where all the carriers are, the largest naval base in the world, and there's huge parking lots, because when a carrier gets underway, uh, you know, all the sailors come in, park their cars. And so they flew out to the carrier when it was at sea off the coast of Virginia, and then they rode the carrier in it at the end of the day. They did flight ops and all of this stuff. And uh, they landed. The carrier pier side, and he got in a car and took him over to visit. And as they're driving... Off the pier, you go through this kind of valley with parking lots on both sides, full of cars. So Groshev said, Why are, what are all those cars? He said, well, that's where the sailors park. And he says, you let sailors have cars? <laughs> he said, they could drive away. They wouldn't come back. And the other thing he said, he watched all the people on the flight deck, all these brown shirts and green shirts and yellow yeah. shirts and, you know, he said, well, that, you know, that guy, he's 19 years old. He just came from someplace, and he's been in the Navy two years, and he's attaching the aircraft to the catapult. And the guy says, you're lying to me. You would never entrust a listed person to do that in our armed forces. Wow. So that tells you a little bit about some of the challenge that they have when things don't go quite right. That is really interesting. Yeah. And so, I think that talks about why I thought I was in the military. Freedom, democracy, bringing people, giving them an environment where they can show, they can be the best that they can be. And I think the sons and daughters that serve our military for the most part have an opportunity to be the best that they can be. And that's why, for the most part, uh, at least at a tactical level, we do pretty darn well. That's a great way to end this discussion really good way to and thank you very much yeah my Th pleasure thank you for what you s said throughout in particular <laughs>